If you have your Bibles, turn to John 17. This morning we're in week number five in our study about the power of prayer. And we adopted as our scripture text the high and holy priestly prayer that we find in John 17. The first Sunday we looked at John 17, we got an overview of this intimate and sacred conversation between God on earth and God in heaven. And then the next two Sundays, we looked at Jesus, the Son, the one who prayed. And then last week, we took a look at God the Father, the one to whom Jesus prayed. And this morning, we're going to look at those for whom Jesus prayed. We'll do that in just a moment. But as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his Father first. Father, we thank you for the little ones that have been born into our church over this past year. We thank you for healthy babies and children. I thank you for giving them to Christian mom and dads and Christian homes. And I pray for a great celebration and dedication of those homes and those families to you next hour. Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to write everything down that we needed as a guideline to live by. That you tore up the law, but you gave us your wisdom and your guidance. And then that wasn't enough. And so not only did you give us your word, but you put your spirit inside of us to help us to be more like Jesus. And that's our prayer as we open this passage this morning, that we would learn more about conversation with you and how much you want to hear from us every moment of every day for our prayer life to become more powerful and more meaningful. And so that's our prayer, Father. Let us understand you and talking to you and who you are a little bit better so that we might communicate more efficiently. As we open your word, Father, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And we pray that in the time that remains that we would hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. In Jesus' name, amen. John 17, follow along with me. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray 
that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Now, in just a minute, we're going to take a look at the people that Jesus prayed for. But before we do that, there's one sore thumb that sticks out of this text that we need to take a look at on the front end. So let's do that quickly. Sore thumb number one and only this morning. I want you to please note that one of the people that Jesus prayed for was himself. In John 17, 1 through 4, before Jesus prays for his disciples and for us, he first prays for himself. You know, the SUV that I drive has 268,000 miles on it. And the little truck I had before that had 332,000 miles on it. How many miles do you think either one of those vehicles would have if they hadn't been taken care of? If the oil hadn't been changed regularly, if they hadn't been serviced every 5,000 miles and the tires rotated and the brake pads replaced, they wouldn't have lasted long had they not been serviced and maintained regularly and consistently. Well, I want you to know that the same thing applies to you and us as human beings, or you and I as human beings. If our lives are not properly maintained and cared for, then we're not going to last very long either. In this high and holy prayer of John 17, Jesus prays for his disciples and he prays for us, but first he prays for himself. On a Monday after a Ladies' Day weekend here at the church, back in October, in the fall, I woke up that Monday morning and I couldn't stand up straight. My back hurt so bad, I can't tell you. I went to the doctor the next day and she said, what have you been doing? And I said, I've been lifting tables and lifting chairs and stacks of chairs and setting things up and tearing things down to get ready for Ladies' Day. Now, she has this computer tablet that she writes on when she's taking notes about your problem and what she's going to do to fix it. And that computer tablet shows your past history, too. She said, you were in here for the same thing, back problems, on October 22nd of last year, 2015. And you were also here in October of 2014, the year before. And I said, yeah, Ladies Day is always the third weekend in October. And the same thing happens every year. And Dr. Weir looked at me and she said, Bill, are you a slow learner? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, did it ever dawn on you that you can't lift tables and chairs without ending up in here barely able to walk? And then she said, what good are you going to be to your congregation if you're home in bed, unable to function properly and I said, yeah, I guess I really am a slow learner. Jesus took care of a lot of folks when he was here for 33 years. But he also took care of himself. He healed people, he fed people, he taught people, he forgave people. But he got on his knees and he asked the Father to take care of his needs too. You know, when we started this study on prayer, we talked about praying for the little things like parking spaces and good hair days. A few of you came to me and you said, I didn't know that I could pray for myself. And it was an aha moment when you found out that you could. You need to understand that not only can you pray for yourself, but you have to pray for yourself if you want to meet the needs of those that God sends to you. Miriam Udaly has gone home to be with the Lord last year at 100 years old, but I remember five years before that, we were studying the subject of prayer. I said exactly the same things that I'm saying in this sore thumb about praying for yourselves and that we need to pray for ourselves, that God takes care of us. 
She came out the back door and hugged me with tears in her eyes at 95 years old. And she said, I've been praying every day for 95 years, and I never knew that I could pray for myself. Some of you are single moms and single dads and, and caregivers to others. How are you going to be able to take care of those who are dependent upon you if you don't first take care of yourself? You see, you've got to be helped before you can help. You've got to be loved before you can love. You've got to be forgiven before you can forgive. You've got to ask God to meet your needs before you can go out and meet someone else's needs. This microphone that I'm speaking into would be dead and useless if the batteries it uses weren't charged on a regular basis. And your batteries need charge too. You know, sometimes I go to the Father and I say, Father, I know that you've sent me to dry people's tears, but sometimes, Father, I can't see those tears because my tears are blinding my eyes. Father, I know you've sent me out to bind up broken hearts, but the problem is mine is broken too right now. Father, I know that you've sent me to tell people about your forgiveness, but the problem is I feel so guilty about my sins. And so, Father, I need you first to dry my tears. I need you first to bind up my broken heart. I need you first to give me the feeling of forgiveness and freedom so that I can minister to others in your name. Jesus prayed for himself first before he prayed for others. And it's okay for us to do the same. All right, with that appetizer out of the way, onto the main course. The ones that Jesus prayed for when he prayed. We've looked at Jesus, the one who prayed. We've looked at God, the Father, the one Jesus prayed to. And this morning, we're going to look at those Jesus prayed for. And in studying this text this past week and looking at those that Jesus prayed for, I found that there were two aspects of his prayer for believers. First of all, he makes statements about them. And then he makes requests for them to his father. In other words, Jesus says, this is what they are in me, and this is what they need because of what they are in me. And so this morning, we're going to look at the statements Jesus makes about us. And the next Sunday morning, we'll look at the requests that he makes about us. So first, let's check out the statements. First of all, I want you to know that those who bear the name of Jesus Christ live in a present reality. Verses 7 and 8. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a truthful reality, that Jesus came from God, that he was sent by God, and that he was God in the flesh. And as believers, we're the only ones who have that reality and live in that reality. And everybody else who doesn't believe what we believe is walking around in this make-believe world trying to make fact out of fantasy. And the crazy thing is that they think that we are the ones who've been sold the big lie. They think that Christians are dreamers. And nothing could be further from the truth. The unbelievers are the dreamers. And if they don't make a decision for Jesus and live in reality, then their dreams are going to turn to nightmares. You see, believers believe truth and live truth. It's the pagans, the unbelievers, who have been sold the big lie. When you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you begin living eternal life right then, right there, with an address in eternity, and your destination is heaven. But what the pagans, the dreamers, don't understand is that everybody is living eternally. Life begins at conception, but it never ends. Life is eternal. It just has two destinations. You can be a believer and believe the truth about Jesus and end up in heaven. Or you can be a dreamer and let life pass you by and end up in hell. But understand that both heaven and hell are eternal destinations. The only question is where? Where are you going to live eternally? You say, well, God would never do that. God would just never do that. He would never send anybody to hell to suffer eternally. Really? Really? Have you heard about the Old Testament God who commanded Joshua and the Israelites to put to death every man, woman, and child, even the livestock of every city that they conquered? Does that sound like a God who can't make the difficult decisions? 
You see, the dreamers have to decide whether they're going to continue to dream or admit that they are sinners like the believers and that they need help getting past that state of sinfulness and that Jesus is the only way to do that. Did you ever buy something you had to take home and put together before you could use? Man, I have. And let me tell you something, I always turn to the directions last because I think I can put everything together without any help. I'm stubborn, I'm independent, I have control issues. I always start trying to put it together without looking at the directions. But I always end up having to read the directions. And when I read the directions, I always think, son of a gun. So that's where those legs are supposed to be, on the bottom instead of on the top. Or that's why I had 16 parts left over that I didn't use. And you begin to see how everything fits together. Well, let me tell you something. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's given us the directions right here in this book to how everything fits together. And you can believe and start living in the present reality or you can continue to dream and make it to the end of your life with a lot of parts left over. The choice is yours. But remember, there are always consequences to not reading the directions. All right, secondly... Those who bear the name of Jesus Christ not only live in a present reality, but they also occupy a temporary state. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 16, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. And then Hebrews 11, 13, 14, and 15 says, all these people died still having what God had promised, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. What's he saying? He's saying that we occupy a temporary state, that this life that we think is going to last forever is so temporary. It's a stopover. It's a third-rate hotel on our way to be home with Jesus forever. You know, we think something bad sometimes is permanent. And when we think something bad is permanent, we lose hope. We become overwhelmed. But if you know that that something bad is only temporary and something greater is coming after that, you can deal with anything. You can keep your hope and you can look forward to the future. If somebody came to you and said they were going to build you a magnificent mansion, the mansion of your dreams, that it was going to be the finest mansion that's ever been constructed on the face of the earth, they were going to give it to you free, you didn't have to pay a dime for it. The bad part was it was going to take three years to build it. And in that three years, you had to live in just a little one-room efficiency apartment. Now, with that mansion coming, that you have no idea how wonderful it's going to be, the best on earth, would you spend a lot of time and trouble and money on that little one-room apartment? Would you put down new hardwood floors, granite countertops? Would you spend a lot of money on the cabinets and the curtains and the furniture and the wallpaper and the paint. No, you wouldn't even mess with that at all because you know that it's only temporary. And if you know that this life is only temporary, why do you try and build something permanent here? Why do you worry and fear leaving here for something that is so much better? A mansion that's going to be permanent forever. Luke chapter 2, which is the story of the birth of Jesus, starts out this way in the King James. And it came to pass... And it came to pass. And that can be applied to almost everything that we face in this life. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. But no matter how many have a heavy heart or a heavy burden, remember, it's only temporary. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. When a child has a loose tooth, they panic. They think it's the end of the world. Don't pull it. Don't touch it. It's going to hurt. And then the tooth comes out on its own. It goes under the pillow, the tooth fairy comes, the money shows up, a new tooth tooth comes in. That tooth didn't come to stay, that tooth came to pass.
Do you know what the absolute worst thing in the world about being a pastor is? Let me tell you. It's when you have to leave a church where God's called you to be a pastor. It's a horrible, horrible time. You stand and you look out over your congregation and you see people that you love, people that you baptized and people that you married. You see hearts that were broken and God allowed you to be there to go through that difficult time with them and you got to go. You got to leave because God has called you someplace else. That's why you're stuck with me here. Because I don't ever want to go through that again. But I remember what it was like. I remember thinking, dear God, I can't do this. I can't lead these people. But do you know what was salvation to me when I was going through all that in Florida before we came here? It was the letters of encouragement that we got from you guys when you knew that we were coming. And in the midst of all the pain and the heartache of leaving, it let us know that what we had was only temporary. It was just a season in our life. And that something bigger and better and permanent was waiting on us in Indiana. If you're a believer, what you've got here is temporary. Something better is coming. But if you're not a believer, you've got a problem. Because this is temporary. And something a whole lot worse is coming for you. Thirdly, I want you to see that those who bear the name of Jesus Christ not only live in a present reality, occupy a temporary state, but they also work under a special care. Verse 9, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. Verse 24, Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. He's talking about heaven. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that God is sovereign. And before the foundation of the earth, he knew you and loved you and called you to himself. And all the time you spend here working for him on planet earth, you are held in the hands of a loving father. You are protected and in special care because you belong to him. Billy, our oldest son, started first grade when we lived in Chicago. We were in the city of Schaumburg, a suburb, where we'd built a new home there. And Billy was starting first grade, and it was an experimental school. It was a huge school. And he found out that he had to ride a bus across town in order to get to this new school. He was scared. Scared to death, to be honest. His mother asked him, do you want me to take you to school? And he shook his head no, but his eyes said yes. But he wouldn't have her take him. He wanted to ride the bus like the other kids. And so every morning she would get him up and feed him breakfast, get him ready to go to school, and then she would walk him down to the bus stop in the front of our subdivision. And she would stand there with him at the bus stop until the bus came by, and then she would watch as he got onto the bus and made it safely to a seat. When the bus driver took off, she would wave, and as soon as he was out of sight, she would run back to the house. She would get into her car, and she would go out onto the highway and follow the bus across town. At every stop the school bus made, she would stay behind the bus. And then when the bus pulled into the school, she would pull into a parking place, get out and stand, and she would watch as Billy got off the bus, and she would stay until he made it safely into the school building. And then she'd get back in the car and drive home. He never knew until we told him many years later. That's what Jesus is saying here. You belong to the Father. And when you do, you're under a special care and protection, whether you know it and feel it or not. If the people of God ever really realized how much God loves them, they'd be dangerous. The freedom and the risk that would come would be amazing. Because... When you know you're special, it gives you a great confidence. When you know you're special and protected, it gives you great hope. When you know you're special and protected, it frees you up to risk 
and to live like never before. When I first started out in the ministry 30 years ago, I was scared to death. Scared to death of the wrath of a sovereign God. I just kept waiting for the other shoe to fall and for my ministry to fall apart. And Steve Brown would say to me, Bill, do you ever think that God just loves you? And I was so afraid that it never entered my mind. But now, now I know his grace. And even though I still have a healthy fear of my heavenly father, I also know that he's just crazy about me. And he's crazy about you too. You're a part of a royal family and you operate under the special care of your father. And then fourthly and finally, and very quickly, I want you to see those who bear the name of Jesus Christ not only live in a present reality, occupy a temporary state, work under a special care, but they also look to a future hope. Verse 3, he promises that hope. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. And then in verse 8, he delivers on his promise. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. You see it? Jesus says the only way that you can get to heaven is, and, is to know the one true God. And the only way that you can know the one true God is to know Jesus Christ, his son. Let me say it again. The only way you can get to heaven is to know the one true God. And the only way that you can get to know the one true God is to know Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's a story of a man who died and went to heaven. When he got to the pearly gates, Jesus was standing there. He couldn't figure out why Jesus was there and not St. Peter. Because all the stories he'd ever heard said that St. Peter would be there to meet him at the pearly gates. And Jesus said to this man, why should I let you come in? And the man said, well, I'm a, I'm a good man. I served as a leader in my son's Boy Scout troop. I helped an old lady across the street one time. And oh yeah, one Christmas, I put a whole dollar in a Salvation Army bell ringer's bucket outside of Walmart. Jesus turned to an angel and said, what do you think? The angel said, I vote we give him his dollar back and send him to hell. <laughs> and Jesus said to the man, you see here, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's not what you know, but who you know. Let me say to those of you who are here searching this morning, and we always have those who are, Jesus says, he who believes in me will never die. And that's the only way, believing in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's the only way. I don't beg for Jesus. I don't have to. I won't plead for Jesus or try and manipulate you in any way. But as a friend, can I give you some good advice? If Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life, if he really is who he says he is, if he really is the open door to heaven and eternal life, and you don't know him, I would correct that problem very, very quickly. In verse 3, Jesus promises eternal life to his disciples. In verse 8, they get it. Why? Because they believed him. We can deal with temporary things if we know they're just temporary. Some of you are going through some difficult times, and for me to come up here and talk about eternal life and heaven, kind of difficult. Maybe you can't put yourself in the group of that hope right now. But remember, things change when you believe in a God that's never lied to you. You know, in order to enjoy a rainbow, you first have to endure the rain, right? Let me finish with this. Back during World War I, the pet shop owners in the United States were no longer able to import the beautiful singing canaries from the Hartz Mountains of Germany because we were at war with Germany. So a dealer in New York decided to import the common type of canary from South America and teach them to sing. He recorded the beautiful singing of the German canaries and he played it over and over again, but the South American canaries 
they showed little progress. And then one evening, he made a great discovery. He fixed the record changer so that it would play the same record over and over and over again. Then he put the record on with the singing German canaries. He turned it on, locked up, and he left, and that record kept playing all night long. The next morning, when he opened up his shop, the South American canaries were singing beautifully along with the record. You know what he learned? He found out they could only learn their song in the darkness. And from that day on, he played the recording only at night so that they could learn to sing in the darkness. If you're a Christian, God has given you a song to sing, and it's locked up here in your heart. And sometimes the only way to set it free is to learn to sing it in the darkness. But once you learn to sing in the darkness, you'll never have a problem singing in the light again. Some of you are in darkness right now, and you need to unlock that song that he's given the hope of all those who believe because he's never lied. And concentrate on that which is eternal and not that which is your situation that's simply temporary. Never forget the Psalm 30 verse 5. Weeping may remain for the night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. If you're here and you're not a follower of Christ, we want to give you the opportunity to do so. And so I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner separated from you by my sin. But I don't want to be separated from you anymore. I want to surrender my life to you this morning. I want to walk back across the bridge of Jesus Christ to get home to you. I want to be forgiven, Father. I want to be free. And so I accept Jesus, him crucified on a cross in my place right now. And I thank you for saving me and loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to talk to you this morning before you leave. I want to talk to you about your baptism, about setting up the inauguration of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we invite you to come as we sing this next song.